السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرة ما ما بعد. This is the book of الرقاق كتاب الرقاق from صحيح البخاري. الإمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى he designated this whole book and this whole many chapters only to explain the concept of لا عيش إلا عيش الآخرة that the true life is really the life of the hereafter. Now one interesting chapter here we have is قوله رحمه الله تعالى باب ذهاب الصالحين باب ذهاب الصالحين This is the chapter on the departure of الصالحين the righteous ones which means the death of the righteous ones How do they go away? How do they disappear? How do they vanish? ثم أورد رحمه الله حديث مرداس الأسلمي رضي الله عنه قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يذهب الصالحون الأول فالأول ويبقى حفالة كحفالة الشعير أو التمر لا يباليهم الله بال سبحانه وتعالى In this hadith مرداس الأسلم رضي الله عنه He said Prophet Muhammad صلى الله وسلم عليه mentioned that يذهب الصالحون الأول فالأول He said that the righteous ones will disappear one generation after the other Means every generation that comes will perhaps have less righteous people than the other one. The previous generation will have more righteous people than the next generation. And, and, and basically that, that means chances to have to meet multiple people of, of good akhlaq, good manners are diminishing as you progress you know, in, in, in these generations. And then he said, Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi wa yabqa hufalatun ka hufalat al-shairi aw al-tamr. Then after all that, what is left behind? Hufala, or fi ruwaya hufala, ka hufala al-shair aw al-tamr. What is left behind is just the leftovers. You know when you sell, you sell dates, and you sell let's say uh, wheat or barley. What is left in the box? What is left in that in that basket? Will be just the peels, and the and the and the dry, uh, uh, you know, leftover, that no one would even look at. No one would care to buy, even, even actually, even uh, try to even bargain with you over these issues. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever stays behind, they're going to be left over just like those dry peels of the dates, or even just uh, 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 what is left from barley or, or, uh, uh, or wheat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not even look at them, would not care about them. So here's the thing. The Prophet ﷺ says another hadith before. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم خير الناس قرني ثم الذين لونهم ثم الذين لونهم. This is the best generation, he said, is my generation. The Prophet says the best generation is my generation. ثم الذين لونهم ثم الذين لونهم. Then the generation that comes next, then the generation that comes next. Meaning basically, as you progress, not too many will be on the on the example of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then generations will come after that. And that type of generation will be any, uh, will, will lose the essence and the manners and the akhlaq of the previous ones. Hatta annahum, whenever they speak, they lie. Whenever they, they even testify, before they've been asked to give their testimony. Basically, they run. They, they always run, you know, ahead of everything uh, to lie about their testimonies. And when they promise, they don't fulfill their, 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 their promise. As, uh, uh, as they're supposed to be. So their akhlaq and their manners change completely. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he recommended for us that if we're ever going to live our life, always look at the standard or the akhlaq and the manners and the lifestyle, the standard basically, of these best generations. The best generation, we look at how the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, uh, they lived their life, how the Sabi'een, the followers of the companions, they, they saw this life and how they looked at it, how they understood it. Not necessarily lifestyle in terms of housings and, and transportation and so forth, as much as the perception of it, the understanding of life. How should you really look at this dunya compared to the akhirah? That's what the Prophet ﷺ means when we follow the example of the Sahaba. We also follow the example and the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. See, now today we're living 1500 years after the time of the Prophet. ﷺ. Imagine the generation we live in comparing to the way. You know, the time of the Prophet <coughs> To show you how things are completely difficult to comprehend at that level even. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. She said uh, during her lifetime, she 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 composed this line of poetry, Basically, she said, Those who deserve to live amongst are all gone. And she's speaking about the generation of the senior Sahaba. Imagine Aisha, she grew up in the household of the Prophet Muhammad around the Masjid of Rasulullah and all what she saw is the senior Sahaba, the ulama of the Sahaba, the righteous ones, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And she always, she always heard wisdom from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and these, these companions. And as she grew older, the senior sahaba are now dying. That, their time is up. So as she grew older, because she was very young, as she grew older, that generation was kind of vanishing and disappearing. And then when she, she became so old, radiallahu anha, in her 60s and her late 50s, she was looking around. There is no one of the people that she recognized back in those days. They're all gone. And now she starts thinking, subhanAllah, I mean, those who deserve to live among them are all gone. The Sahaba, the companion. And now I'm living in a generation that had no clue. They don't even understand what Nubuwa was, what the Prophet did, what the sacrifice means, what the living for the Akhirah means. They haven't seen that. And if I want to compare something here, it's, it's a comparison between the young ones who grow up in America and the young ones who grew up in, uh, in some Muslim countries. Now, it depends on which Muslim country. If you live in a Muslim country in a very, very conservative, traditional uh, yani, uh, household, young ones are, are taught to be polite, to have good manners, akhlaq, they don't answer back, they respect the elders. They have an amazing, amazing standard of akhlaq. Now, that was before the age of the satellite and the internet, of course, because now things have changed even there, subhanAllah. But back then, when they didn't have this exposure to any you know, ill uh, manners and akhlaq and so on, they used to have these. And alhamdulillah, we still have generation that has this, these beautiful akhlaq and manners. Versus the kids who grow up in America over here. Kids grow up in America since they're young, when they're pre-K and, K and kindergarten, they are taught this, this very, you know, weird notion that you're so special. They keep teaching them when they're young, you're so special. You're so special, you're so special. It's all about extreme, radical life of individualism. It's all about me, it's all about I. And even the technology is feeding you know, off that culture of me and I, that today even the things that you see out in the market, it's all about I. Like iPad, iPod, <laughs> iTunes, and I miserable, something like that. It's all about I and I and I. It's about you, it's not about living you know, the standard of a righteous generation. They don't care about the generation that you live in or the generation that lived, that lived before you. It's all about who you are, what you want to do, and how you want to live your own life the way you want it to be. And with that given to them, we have very high rate of, uh, of divorce among young couples, uh, very high rate of uh, and, and, uh, and corruption among the youth in terms of akhlaq and manners, and also very high rate of suicide because their life is completely meaningless to them. It's miserable because there is no model for them that they can look up to and emulate and follow. But for the Muslims, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala were the best model. They were the best model. So if you want to live your life, you're going to need to look at this, at this generation. What did they do? And what type of love they led radiallahu anhu? In this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the righteous generation will disappear one after the other. However, here's the thing. Even though generation, good generations or righteous generations will be exterminated, will be gone, that doesn't mean we will never have yani, good people or good uh, groups, I would say, or individuals in, in every single community. And Nabi says, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي على الحق. There will always be a group of people among, of course, the Muslim Ummah and, and the world, yani, على الحق, they're following the truth. لا ضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم. They're not hurt or harmed by those who, who disagree with them or kind of differ with them. Until they die and they're still following that same path. So the Sahaba, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, who are these people? And the Prophet gave definition in different versions of the hadith. He said, Those who follow my example, the example of my companions. Meaning, always look back at that generation 
and then follow the best example that you see in there. So there will always be some, alhamdulillah, torch of guidance. If you have light at the end of that tunnel. So when you see someone of these good qualities and good akhlaq, these are the type of people you need to associate yourself with. These are the type of people you need to look for in this dunya. Because the average is not for you, Allah. If you're looking for the akhirah, the average is not for you. If you're pursuing the high ranks in al-Jannah, the average is not yours. It's not for you. You can have always to start from above average. Always from above average. And then you go to excellence and all the way up to exceptional and so on. And now, how many, how many people can you find around you who will fit that criteria of being of the righteous one and the good one? They're not that many. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورٌ Few among my, my, my servants are the grateful ones. Allah says, few among the, the, the servants of Allah are truly grateful. So there won't be as many. There are always few. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Not all people, even if you try, regardless how much effort you put in there, not all people, not, all, not most people are mu'mineen, that they believe and they follow that. And then, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, another hadith, he made it very clear to us that whenever you look for a good companion in this dunya, uh, you always need to look for someone that you can trust in with your life. And in this example, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّمَ النَّاسِ كَإِبْلِ الْمِعَ لَا تَكَادْ تَجُدُ فِيهَا رَحِلٍ The example of people are the example of 100 camels. You can barely find one that is suitable for right. I know for us here, not, we're not the people of desert, although we live in Texas, yeah. But still, if you ever been, if you ever went to uh, the Bedouin culture, you ever went with the, with the uh, uh, people who have camels, and uh, uh, you yourself, basically, when you look at these camels, all of them for you, all of them are the same. You look at all these camels, you think that they're all the same. In terms of, uh, you could all use them for right, you could use them for, for food, you could use them for meat, you could use them for whatever you could use them, want, want to use them for. But for the Bedouin, the one who lives in the desert, they know that they're, they're not all equal. And if you're going to be using one camel for a ride, you're going to have to find the best camel. Why is that? Because the desert is extremely, extremely harsh and extremely, extremely dangerous. You will have only one chance that if you're going to cross the desert, you're going to have one chance to have the best camel with you. Otherwise, if you don't be careful with your choice, you're going to get stranded. If it dies on you, Something wrong happens with it, if it's not strong enough to, cut, to, to go through to cross the desert, you're going to be extremely in big, big trouble. The example of this, the Prophet says, from every hundred people around you, you can call them all friends. Specifically in our, the age of Facebook, tabarakallah. People, they have thousands of friends, virtual friends. It's thousands of friends. If you invite all of them for your graduation, perhaps even one, only one person will show up. Why? Because that's the only real friend you have, you know, physical friend in your realm. The rest of them are all virtual, somewhere else in the world. And you call them friends. For what? They're all considered acquaintances to you, perhaps, and friends to you. But how many of these people you can trust with your life? And that journey that we're taking here, the journey that we go through the desert, like the Bedouin who goes through the desert, is our journey through this life. That journey through this life is just, it's so dangerous just like the journey through the desert. I personally grew up in an area, desert area basically, Kuwait. And we went camping in the desert. Sometimes we spent 15 days camping. We camped in Medina in the desert as well. We camped in the UAA as well in the desert, in the oasis. You see that, subhanAllah. It's majestic in terms of beauty. Allah, is, it's one of the most beautiful experiences when you camp in the beautiful desert, subhanAllah. However, it deceives you because it's extremely harsh. When it gets hot, it gets extremely, extremely dangerous. And at night, all of a sudden, temperatures drop down. You can feel the cold penetrate your bone. SubhanAllah, it's extremely, extremely dangerous. And that's how life is. It's deceiving. You look around, it's much, it's so beautiful. Everything's gonna be okay. We should be safe and so on. But then events happen just like the drop of temperatures. Suddenly they're below zero. And in a few hours, how it's extremely hot. That's how dangerous it is. Therefore, if you're going to be just being looking around and get deceived by this, that what you see, chances you're not going to cross that desert. 
the camel that you need to carry with you has to be so strong. You should trust your, yani by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will of Allah azza wa put trust in Allah first and then in that camel to help you go across that dangerous terrain. And that is the essence of having a good friend with you. A friend from every 100 people, there is that person whom you can trust with your life, that they will take the journey with you towards the hereafter. We are in this dunya for the moment we are born, we start our journey. The moment we are born, we start our journey. Our journey is to return back to where we came from, Majjannat al Firdaus, Allahumma Amin. Now, as you go, you need companionship. You need a guide. You need help. You need something that, that you can rely on. And that is the meaning of Hadith al Nabi sallallahu Inna man nas kabil People like 100 camels. From each 100 camel, you can barely find one that is suitable to take you across the desert. The rest of them are good for milk, good for meat, good for whatever you take. But to trust that camel to cross the desert with, no, no, no. Not any camel can do that for you. And that's exactly your friends who are around you. You'll have a lot of friends with whom you enjoy time and you spend, you know, whether it's games or even making partnerships or what type of, whatever activity that you do in life. You have plenty of friends. But how many of these friends truly and genuinely, how many of them can you really say, you know what, I can trust this person with my life? If you can't find anybody, you're in big trouble. Means you're hanging with the wrong crowd. But if you can find someone, if you can find this person, then hold on to this person. Because that's the type of person, subhanAllah, that you, you will always lean on when you need something for the akhirah, not necessarily for the dunya. And if you ask me personally, I know a lot of people, mashallah. But how many people really can I yani, feel safe to talk to them, my personal concerns and and ask them guidance through the Akhirah. Wallahi, not, not that many. And as a matter of fact, it's only one, one person. When I need really to, uh, yeah, to vent out and talk and, and have some advice from a good friend of mine, I just have to call him. He's overseas. And he's in Kuwait. He's another Imam there in Kuwait. I call and we just talk. So, okay, what do you have? And she start advising each other and trying to help each other, subhanAllah. And just once you feel good, then you move on, continue with your life. The generations that we live in right now are completely different from what they used to be in the past. But Alhamdulillah, every generation still have these torches of, of guidance that you should look for. So look for that person, the Prophet Sallallahu says, one individual can be very insufficient for you, inshaAllah. Mm -hmm. In the other hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu says, قَالَ بَابُ مَا يَتَّقِي مَا يَتَّقَى مِنْ فِتْنَةِ الْمَالِ this is a chapter on how should we protect ourselves from the trials of wealth. You say wealth is a trial? Of course it is a trial. As a matter of fact, being rich perhaps is much more dangerous than being poor. Because being rich, you get distracted by the na'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you might not see, you might not see really the difficulties and the trials other people are going through. But that's of course it's not the case all the time. And that's why we, we ask this question many, many times, who is better? Is it the righteous or is it is a, a, a rich person who is grateful or a poor person who is patient? And if I ask you this question again, who is best? Who do you think is better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it a rich person who is grateful to Allah azza wa jal? Or is it a poor person who is patient? Now let's look at it first. Whenever we say someone who is extremely, extremely wealthy and rich, what is the image that pops in your mind when we talk about wealth and rich people? Is it masajid that comes into your mind? No. Fasting? Giving charity? Of course not. The image that comes into our mind usually is people are partying and they're throwing money here and there. That's what comes to our mind when we talk about rich people. Imagine when you see someone who's rich, who has the ability to act like you think they would act, but instead they chose to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thankful for the na'am that they have in their hands. Isn't that something impressive? Of course. Because they're curbing their desires for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you see them being grateful, that's a blessing from Allah azza wa Now let's look at the poor person. When I say a poor person, what do you think of someone who is poor, extremely poor and destitute? We always think of a poor, someone who is broken heart, He's so, you know, miserable in his life. He's just struggling to, 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 uh, uh, to provide for his family and children and so on. 
And whenever you ask them, you think that they're always going to say Alhamdulillah. That they're very patient. That's what you think that we're going to see. We don't think of a poor who's becoming a thug. He's robbing like Robin Hood, going after the rich. So they can rob them, kill them, whatever, take revenge because they're poor. They might be drug dealers at some point in their lives. Why? Because they want to get rich as quick as possible. Or maybe join the NFL, perhaps, maybe. So they can become very rich as soon as possible, right? But the point, which is off the topic, yeah. <laughs> but the point is, many people, many people, whenever we think of someone who's poor, we do not think of people who are, and under, unless someone is patient. But we don't think of people who will be the ungrateful. We have even arrogance. And there are people who are poor and they're so arrogant. So now the question one more time. Who is better? Someone who is rich and grateful or someone who is poor and patient? What do you guys think? The rich is grateful, right? You're so biased, as you know. Actually, it's neither. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, the best of the two is the most righteous. Is the one who is most righteous. It doesn't matter being rich or poor, but being righteous, that's what matters the most. So when Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala says here, this is the trial of wealth. Ma yuttaqa bihi min fitna al-mal, how to protect yourself from the trial and the fitna uh, of, of being of wealth. He mentioned hadith here rahimahullah ta'ala, qala an ibn Abbasin radiyallahu anhu ma qal. Samiatu al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yuqul, law kan al-ibn Adam wa adiyani min mal, tabtaga thalitha. وَلَا يَمْلَأُ جَوْفَ بْنِ آدَمْ إِلَّا التُّرَابِ وَيَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَنْ تَعْبُ says in this hadith that لَوْ كَانَ لِبْنِ آدَمَ وَادِيَانِ مِنْ مَالِ لَبْتَغَى ثَالِكَ If the son of Adam, if the son of Adam had two valleys of, of wealth, which means imagine you have an entire valley filled with all types of wealth, gold, silver, cattle, uh, camels, whatever, everything you can think of of wealth of that time basically, even our time, whatever you consider wealth. Imagine if you have that. He says if you had two of them, two valleys that full with wealth, لَبْتَغَى إِلَيْهِ مَا ثَالِثَا You would wish for third. You would wish for third. There was another version of the hadith the Prophet said at the beginning, لَوْ كَانَ لَهُ وَادٍ مِنْ ذَهَبْ لَبْتَغَى إِلَيْهِ ثَانِيَا If you had one valley full of gold, you would wish for a second. And if you're given two, you would wish for third. What does that exactly mean to you? That means if you get three, what are you going to do? Four. Wish for fourth. What if you are given fourth? You wish for fifth and you will never stop wishing for more. So for those who always pursue the dunya, because inshallah, once I get to my first million, that's it, I'm going to retire inshallah. When I hit the million, I'm going to inshallah stop. Some other people, they say, Inshallah, when I, when I hit the, the six-figure salary, khalas, alhamdulillah. I'm going to start now relaxing and come to the masjid more because alhamdulillah, I secured myself for the rest of my life. Well, when they hit the six-figure, what do they start thinking of? When I get my quarter million, inshallah, salary. And then when they hit the quarter million, what do they start thinking of? Inshallah, half a million. And then when, you start, when they hit the half million, what do you start thinking? Million, and you will never stop wishing for more, which means it's always going to be a distraction. It will always remain distraction to you. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "Wala yamla ujofa ibn Adam illa turab." Nothing will fill the belly of the son of Adam except for dirt, which means what? When they're buried. That means they're going to always think that way until they die. Another narration: The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said another version of the Hadith. وَلَا يَمْلَوْ عَيْنَ ابْنَ آدَمْ وَلَا يَمْلَوْ عَيْنَ ابْنَ آدَمْ إِلَّا التراب. Nothing will fill the eye of the son of Adam إِلَّا التراب. But dirt, how is that? You know sometimes, yeah, subhanAllah, it's unbelievable how, how sensitive the eye of the son of Adam is. لا إله إلا الله And you remember when a speck of dirt or dust even goes into your eye, how do you feel it? You feel it like a mountain like a mountain or a rock in your eye, I cannot take it out. Although when you go and you wash it off, subhanAllah, it's just a speck of dirt and dust, that's all. But it felt like a mountain in your eye. And that's the exact meaning of it. So his eye, whenever you see wealth, it's not enough. Even though it's huge and it's already filling your eyes, 
not physically, but the sight of it is filling your eyes, but it's not sufficient yet. But when a speck of dust gets into your eye, suddenly your eye becomes full. You're going to have to take it out. Try to take it out. That's how the son of Adam is. And subhanAllah, the example of going after the dunya is the example of digging a hole. The more you dig, the more you dig, where would you go, Jama'ah? You go deeper, right? So the more you dig into the dunya, what happens to you? You get deeper and deeper. And the more you dig, you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Now here's a trick. If you did not solidify the walls while you were digging, what's going to happen to you? You're going to bury yourself. If you don't solidify these walls, protecting yourself from these walls as you dig deeper, you're going to you ruin your life and you're going to bury yourself. And that's exactly the same thing when people they don't think about the consequences of digging. And they keep digging and digging and digging and digging and eventually don't see what they're going. And they're only not excited about what? We're getting deeper, it's getting easier. It's getting much easier now because it's getting softer, easier and easier. And then suddenly they realize they're too far from getting back. And that becomes extremely dangerous. So some people, they say, okay, what's the solution? There's something in leadership, they call it the, the, they call it the, the rule of the hole. The rule of the hole or the rule of digging, basically. If you see yourself in a hole, if you basically find yourself in a hole, what do you need to do first? What is the first thing to do to get out of it? Stop. Huh? Stop. Bury it before that. Stop digging. The first thing you do is stop digging. If you see yourself deep in a, in a hole, the first thing you need to do is to stop digging. Because some people, they keep digging and say, Ya Akhi, SubhanAllah, how can I get up there? But until I find a way, let me just dig more. Until I find a way, let me just dig more. That's exactly what happens in our life. People, they're getting so distracted in the dunya, and because they don't see any, any immediate or, or, or kind of close return, they keep saying, okay, until I figure it out, I'm just going to keep going. It's not going to happen. If this is what is distracting you, taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first thing you need to do is first stop digging, which means you need to stop going in that direction. You need to start finding a way of doing that. How would you do it? There are multiple ways. Ask and help from people. Try perhaps start, you know, whatever you do, start throwing the dirt underneath your feet. And one step at a time, you kind of climb up. Dig basically holes in those walls. Start to get up, but it's going to be a, a toiling effort. You're going to have to put some effort into getting out from that, from that mess that you put yourself in. The Prophet says, But is it even possible that we can reverse our life if we took ourselves into the fitna of wealth? The answer is yes. Because the Prophet says in this hadith at the end of it, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Meaning, Whoever repents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the repentance. Some of the ulama, they give interpretation or commentary on this hadith, another meaning, instead of saying repent, say no, taba means return. Meaning if anyone reversed, if anyone tries to come back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will give them the chance. Allah will allow them to return back to see things different. Now last point I want to share here with you. Does it mean that as Muslims, we're not allowed to uh, accumulate wealth? What do you guys think? Is it permissible to accumulate wealth? Can you? Yes. Can you be rich? That's the question. As a Muslim, can you be rich? Of course, yes. The answer is absolutely. There is nothing wrong with being rich. As a matter of fact, some of the great Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, were of the wealthiest people of their time. Do you guys, can you give me an example of rich Sahaba? Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu. Uthman ibn Affan. How do, you, how do you measure his wealth and his, uh, his uh, yani, uh, level of his, uh, his wealth, mashallah? Do you remember any incidents that he did? He purchased the well, the water well, when they were going into the battle of uh, uh, Tabuk. And he prepared the whole army. And he supplied an entire army, an entire army of 1,000 camel <coughs> with a lot of uh, supplies on it. And by the way, when you say 1,000 camel, every 100 camel back then was like $1 million to us today. Every, one, every 100 camel is equivalent to $1 million for us today. So when he supplies 1,000 camels, you can imagine how much he supplies, radiallahu anh, like saying $10 million, that's just the price of the camels, not the supplies. 
not the 10 million dollars basically of our time, not even more than that. Radiallahu anhu. That's one Sahabi. Who else is Imam? Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he was such a clever, clever merchant. And that's the quality of the people of Mecca back then. And more than the, the Ansaris. The Ansaris were farmers. Ahl Zira, they used to work in agriculture. But uh, the Meccans, they were merchants, business people. That's why they're very clever. So when Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he came to Medina, immigrant, he had nothing with him except for the, the clothes on his back. And when the Prophet sallallahu he did the mu'akha, the brotherhood between them, and the Ansar, he asked them to share whatever they have in this from the material of this dunya. The man who shared with, with Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, he wanted to share everything. His house, his wealth, even his family. But Abdurrahman ibn Awf told him, Barakallahu laka fi ahlika malik, may Allah bless your family and your wealth. Where's your market? Just show me the market. Abdurrahman went to the market in one week. In one week, the Prophet sallallahu sees Abdurrahman walking in the, in, the, in the streets of Medina, dressed nicely. And he smells very, very nice. Means he had excess wealth to buy even perfume. So the Prophet says, Bakhin Bakh, mashallah, mashallah. What is this? What's going on? He goes, Ya Rasulullah, there's a wish. I got married. SubhanAllah. He even had money enough to get married. And he said, Ma'am Hartaha, what did you give her as a, as a dowry and a gift? So it was Nunawatin Dahaba. I gave her the weight of a, a date stone in gold. He had so much money in one week that he was able to give that much money, that much gold, as a gift for his bride, radiallahu anhu. That shows you how clever he was. They used to say about Abdurrahman, he was so clever that he can even he can even transform the desert sand, the desert the, the sand dunes into gold, if he wanted, radiallahu anhu. However, however, Uthman was the third leader of the ummah. He was the son-in-law of the Prophet وسلم, twice, and he was his advisor. So that did not prevent him from being the third righteous, perhaps you could say, in the Ummah radiallahu anhu arda. And he was the man, the Prophet says about him, the angels are, uh, they, they feel shy in the presence of Uthman radiallahu anhu. As for Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Umar ibn Khattab, he chose him as one of the six people who should rule after him. And he's one of the ten people whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa guaranteed Jannah by name. Abdurrahman radiallahu anhu. So being rich is not an offense in Islam. But it's what you do with that wealth. That's what matters the most. Where do you get it from? And how do you use it? Where do you get it from? You're going to be asked about that. And where do you spend that wealth? You're going to also be uh, answering the questions. Where do you spend your wealth and your money? So when the Prophet Sallallahu says that be aware of the trial of wealth, remember, it's not about being rich as much as where are you getting that wealth from and how are you using this wealth in this dunya and seeking the reward, of course, of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in the Akhir. والله تعالى any questions yes the question is about uh, this notion of getting groups and other things I heard uh, uh, Dr. Ismail Ahmed no saying that uh, in this world that is too capitalistic in nature where only greed drives you to get richer and richer it is a dangerous business to get Mm -hmm. So this whole system that we live in, it is, you know, it is very different from what Sahaba were living in, mm -hmm. and where they had a balance and they had this notion all around that, you know, yes, we have to get richer, but at the same time we have other responsibilities as well. Yeah. And uh, perhaps even, uh, uh, later on they were in Islamic system. So, but this is no. Yeah. And the question is basically, can we get? rich in this capitalist system can we get rich in a halal way without getting distracted more and more uh, based on the concept of greed that is this economy based on exactly. and one more thing i want to add is that as i see as i see my career for example uh, i work and I, if i want to get promotion i have to work really hard and this is something you touched upon mm -hmm. in the very first lecture as well and that is you know exactly true but if, let's say, if I want to be a director, for example, I have to do up my personal uh, life. That's yes. for sure. There is no way I can get to that, that position. So the thing is, I, and uh, when I'm a director, for example, or anybody else is a director, they show you this is how much bonus you're going to get, this is how much wage you're going to get. And it is, it is about becoming rich. But why is that? 
why is it is because I'm in the system? I'm in the system. No, it's because you chose to get into the system. No, I chose. You chose to get into the rat race, yeah. working for other people. Yeah. And that's why they're getting richer and richer mm -hmm. on the account of your personal life. But I, I know the businessmen as well. I mean, no. they are true, they are true. I'm not saying I'm not saying that's the whole concept of this hadith. If you get yourself into business, into the life of this world, mm -hmm. it's very distracting and you start digging and digging and digging, thinking that inshallah when I hit the million dollar I'm gonna retire. Mm -hmm. And that million dollar to make it's gonna take you thirty five years of your lifetime. So when you get when you hit the million and you like you hit the jackpot basically and it says, Alhamdulillah, finally you look back, you're already seventy two years old. How much is left? To me, it appears that uh, you have to be righteous first before you think of being rich. It's not about being righteous before you get in, becoming rich. It's really, it's all about, it's it's all about because righteousness is regardless of your of your financial status. Righteousness is something that you need to be at all times. So it's it's supposed to be something that it's given. However, some people they take righteousness as an obstacle that prevent them from becoming rich. Why? Because they have this extreme fear, going into the field of business and trying to get rich is going to take me away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it true? I would say absolutely true. It is a very dangerous terrain. But is it for everybody? I don't think so. I know personally, I know some friends. We were actually classmates. We were classmates and sometimes we, were, we, said we lived in the same dorm together. And we were just young ones. SubhanAllah, when the the economy in the UAE, and boom, mashallah, and the, and the, uh, uh, the housing and, and industry of, of, of Dubai increased, they got themselves in some side business. And that side business all of a sudden became really, really good business. So they quit their, their school and start focusing on their business. Now I know I can tell you they are actually multi-million, yani, mashallah, dollar uh, businesses that they're running. However, if you look at the quality of their iman, it's becoming extremely, extremely thin. Yeah, extremely thin, subhanAllah. They got themselves they got themselves also because of the capitalist system. They got themselves yeah, entangled with the banks and loans and this and that and so on. So it's not hundred percent pure anymore. Again, righteousness should not be an obstacle, but should be like a filter. So in the process of becoming inshallah ta'ala rich, That's you need to I'm observe as you, much as you if can. You, if you determine that I'll stay righteous and then put my efforts to be, become rich, irrespective of the result. But there is no guarantee of staying righteous when you become rich. No. Just I mean, like there is no I, that, just like there is just like there is no guarantee for a rich person who did not start righteous, then righteous afterwards. I mean, I know also other people who started their life just looking into the dunya, uh, like there is no akhir. But then at some point in their lives, they reflect and then they realize it's not worth it. So they become more religious and they come and ask and you know I accumulated that much money what can I do to get myself out of this mess? How can I recover? How can I redeem myself? So they ask how much charity will I put my money this and that and so on. So it's it's both ways. Again the whole the bottom line is for Muslims we are requested to find you know wealth. As Muslims there is nothing wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَالِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةً Allah says in Surah Al-Araf قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ Who is the one who can make halal haram? Who is the one who has the right to say for, for Allah that, for what Allah made halal for His servants? قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ This is the, 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 the basically the adornments of this dunya that Allah made halal for you وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ And the good, good provision that Allah provided for you Who can say this is haram for you? He says it's khalisatan, it's to be shared in this dunya between the believers and disbelievers but on the day of judgment khalisatan yawm al qiyamah only for the believers so again we cannot prevent people from being rich or going into that field it's a matter of you know yani self-consciousness and also piety and righteousness wallahu ta'ala I just want to add like one thing I've noticed is that much of our society is driven by our wants and needs and desires. So our wants turns into need. When that happens, it's like the budget starts expanding for our household. You start sure. getting more wants that turn into needs. And then you have this like million dollar budget that you're running your household off of. Now you need another mountain of gold to like run that entire household off Exactly. Of. So it's like when you keep a lower budget and like you try to keep that idea of 
staying away from yourself and staying in a way of living, even $100,000 or $200,000, you can be more wealthier than somebody making $500,000 who has an Aston Martin and a giant house that's all on a loan. True. It's wild. That's a, that's con that concept is that yeah, uh, the brother is saying is that it all starts with your, with, your, uh, uh, with your wants. And when you start pursuing your wants and desires so much, they become, in your own perception, they become needs that you cannot live without. Like, for example, I cannot go to school without iPhone 5. Who said you cannot go to school without iPhone 5? It's because everybody has iPhone 5. And I'm not going to be going to school without having, you know, a matching cell phone, for example. This is for my son, so it's a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> so you cannot always say, you create that need for yourself. You made it a need. It's not even a need, it's not even a want to begin with. Just you created that need that I cannot live without things. And subhanAllah, this is so ironic. I noticed that among the young professionals, by the way. The young professional, when they first get married, when they first get married, mashallah, they get married with a very decent budget. So they start with their salary. It's about 4000 5000 6000 Depends, for example. Alhamdulillah, very decent budget. Where do they go? They go to a small apartment. It's very cozy, very beautiful, because they're just, you know, one, two, and there's no children yet. But then, mashallah, after they continue with their with the work, they get they get raised in their salaries, mashallah. So they get let's say one or two thousand dollars raise. Guess what they do the first thing? Oh. Upgrade. <laughs> Even though now the salary is increasing, so now they they find themselves now they have a better capability of buying things, and that's exactly how the system works. This is how the the, the system is designed to deceive you that if you can if you have two thousand raise means you can buy a better car. You can move to a bigger house. And if you're going to move to a bigger house, what does that mean? I'm not going to carry my furniture with me. No way. <laughs> you bring new furniture. And if you're going to bring new furniture that you're going to have to pay for many years just until you pay it off, guess what? Are you going to drive your car, that crappy car, basically, into that driveway? No way. It has to be matching the whole neighborhood because everybody's driving, mashallah, and it legs us and this and that and so on. Come on, it's a shame to drive these kind of cars into these driveways. So you go and you also upgrade to, so just basically you create a $200,000 budget to your household when you only can afford 50000 if not even less than that. And you start living off debts for the rest of your life. And that's when you dig a hole and you start <coughs> wishing, if, I, if they gave me 2000 what do you start wishing for? Another five, if, it, if it's possible. And when you get the five, alhamdulillah, I got the five. Now start targeting the 10000 extra. And you're always going to be looking up and up. Imagine, imagine if your salary was four thousand dollars. You're living in that apartment, then you got to raise for two thousand dollars, and you stayed in that same apartment. Wouldn't you be living in a better, better condition? Why? Because alhamdulillah, you have enough finances and less worries. Because less debt. Even the bills are less. But the moment you move out of an apartment and you move to a big house, suddenly electricity moves from fifty dollars to $250. And then you start saying, oops, what happened? I've never paid like this in an apartment. In an apartment. Yeah, well, welcome to the household, Jan, the new household. Only you don't this building it, Everything increases on you all of a sudden because this is the price of upgrading in life. The more, the bigger you get in the dunya, the more liabilities you carry with you. And that's exactly what happens towards the akhirah. The more you carry from this dunya, the more liability you will carry with you towards the akhirah. Yes. Um, yeah, same thing with the same addition to uh, Isn't it true that the less you have, the less you have to account for? Oh, absolutely. Have you ever traveled? Have you ever traveled overseas? Yes. Okay, so you guys all traveled overseas, right? Whenever you travel overseas, this is an example of how the more you get, the more you carry with you, the more liabilities you will have. And the less you carry, the easier it will be it will get. If you travel overseas, I mean, travel to mystic flight is easy. You can just carry things, you know, uh, carry on and you move in, and that's it. But when you travel overseas, what do you take with you? You, tra you take everything in, in, in Walmart, perhaps, maybe. Why? Because you have a lot of friends and families and all this. Oh, everybody's expecting for me to bring them chocolates, clothes, shoes, pans, pots, all these things, subhanAllah. They expect you basically to, 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 to have a string, you know, like a, 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 a kind of like a tunnel that goes from America all the way to wherever you're going to be going. So you carry all that stuff with you. Yeah. Now when you come, when you come to, the, to the airport, to your domestic 
airport basically and they see these huge bags let's say a family of five tabarakallah everybody has two many pieces talk about ten huge gigantic pieces when these these basically the the the, uh, the, the, the attendants behind the desk they see these bags what what is the first that comes on their faces it's not amazement first of all it's disgusting you have to say this oh my god they look are they serious and now they have attitude so whenever you try to talk with them to make things easy it's going to make it difficult because they have an attitude right now because of what you're doing and subhanallah allah has designed the malaika of jahannam with an attitude the angels of jahannam they have attitude they don't smile they don't laugh they're stern that's how allah describe them in, in, in the quran alayha malaikatun ghiladun shidad ghilad which means they're rough they're tough with attitude why because you deserved it same thing when you come to that airport and you carry all this luggage with you you're gonna have to wait longer and if the luggage is not balanced what are you gonna do you're gonna start opening them and take one shoes from here put it there and one from here put it there exposing yourself to the public literally you're exposing your dirty laundry to the public <laughs> all your laundry is coming out in the airport and the camera is taking pictures and live feed and all that stuff and sound, subhanAllah. So like in the Akhirah, Allah protect us all. When you carry with you huge luggage, huge baggage of, of uh, sayyat and a'mal and so forth, your laundry is going to be exposed. People, they're going to hear about it, you're going to see it, and they're going to laugh at it, perhaps even the youth, subhanAllah. And the, the more luggage you carry with you, the longer you're going to have to wait. And if it still is not fit, what you're going to do? you're going to have to pay the price. They're going to charge you money. And if you have extra pieces, Allah al-Musta'an. That's even more fine. And you have more clothes in your hand, what are you going to do? You carry it with you, you slow yourself down. You always slow yourself down when you carry things in your hand. Because it's basically, it's a scary idea to carry with you these things. However, when you come to the airport and the only thing you have with you is just a carry-on, you wait, you go, self-check-in no luggage you take your uh, uh, your boarding pass and bismillah you move on better than that when you carry nothing nothing at all you just come straight to to take with your boarding pass and bismillah you don't even have to wait to check your your, your things through of course the scanner and so on just go straight and that is the easiest thing and the best thing you do so my point here is that just like we know here the more luggage the more baggage you carry with you from a dunya the, the longer the wait is going to be in the Akhirah. That again doesn't mean that you, uh, you try to strive to be poor. Instead, if Allah blessed you with wealth, then you need to make sure where it's coming from and how you're using it wisely, inshallah. Any last question? Yes. <coughs> Mujaddi. No. Mm -hmm. the, the brothers asked about Hadith al Mujaddi. The Prophet said that uh, at, the, at the beginning or the end of every hundred years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send someone, will revive somebody uh, from the Muslim Ummah that will help revive their deen for them. You know, back in the days of Bani Israel, the Prophet says, Kanat Bani Israel taquduhum al Anbiya. Bani Israel, they used to be led by the prophets. Every time a prophet dies, another prophet comes after him. But for the Ummah, we don't have that privilege. So what do we have instead? The Prophet says, Ulama or Hadith basically says, Ulama Ummati Anbiya Bani Israel. The scholars of my Ummah are in the place of the, of the Anbiya and the prophets of Bani Israel. So these are the ones who revived the deen for the Ummah. Alhamdulillah. But who, they are, who are these people? How do we identify them? Can we just pinpoint saying this is the alim that was the mujaddid? Now, as long as they're still alive, we can't say that. Because you need to understand that generations overlap. And therefore, which hundred year we're talking about here, they might be alim at the beginning of the generation, but maybe there was someone else who has more impact on the ummah in the, the later part of the generation. So therefore, you cannot say for someone who's alive, this is the mujaddid of the ummah. You can't say that. But we always look at those who've been in the past. We can tell, mashallah, the impact that they left on, on, the, on the ilm and the ummah. 
you can say this man was a mujadid truly. Wallahu a'lam. Nah. Hadith? Yeah, um, you've seen the point that the brother was raising about, uh, you know, I guess, like trying to be righteous I think um, the point is that uh, it's important to establish a relationship with Allah and really get to understand your need. That way you build the values and the foundation before you enter such a system. Because I think, that in my opinion, and from my experiences in this, other people's experiences that I know, the issue is that so many of us, we grow up, and uh, we honestly don't know very much about our dream. You know, and uh, we, of course, we're naturally going to assume the values that the society constantly brainwashes us through media and television and so forth. So it's, uh, you know, and, and sometimes you even find like your own family's kind of, uh, I understand that, you know, the concept that you need to, per to prepare yourself, you know, with ilm and knowledge and proper uh, understanding of the deen before you, you delve into the, the, the subject of, you know, finances and business and wealth and so on. There is no doubt about it. But you need to also to be careful. There is no guarantee. There is no such thing as a guarantee that you are going to remain righteous after you delve into, into this field. Just like, you know, starting humble with, in deen and righteousness, that doesn't mean the person will never become righteous in the future or after it. SubhanAllah, some people, they start, you know, completely non-religious. But when they get into the dunya, suddenly they recover. How many so-called celebrities you guys know they became so rich through songs and, and, uh, and hip-hop and all this stuff and so on. And then subhanAllah, they become Muslims afterwards. Which means they got into the dunya that they wanted. Or everybody wanted to have. Having the wealth, having the fame, the name, the women, the lifestyle, blah, 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 all these things and so on. But at some point, enough is enough. It's no longer satisfactory for them. It doesn't bring them that gratification that they always longed for and always looked for. It's no, it's no longer sufficient for them. It's something beyond material life. And that's when they start coming back out of that life and looking for, for, for a more, more decent and more actually humble lifestyle. Wallah uh, You mentioned earlier that time progresses every generation that's worse. Therefore, the generation we're living in right now is probably the worst one, obviously. No, but still Allah and Muhammad generation is coming next year. No, yeah, but as of now, so far. No. Uh, so, are we going to be judged according to our generation mm -hmm. because you know, I mean, it's very hard to live up to the first generation. You know, you know I, I have to retract a little bit, you know, that when we said that the generation that comes next is always the, the worst, worst than the previous one, which is another statement of the Prophet But always remember, the Prophet said in every generation there will always be that group of people who will revive the deen for the Ummah. Always, in every single generation. Who are these people? He said that those who follow the example of Muhammad and the example of his companions. Look for those people. Those are the ones who are going to keep you, basically, yani, checking you, or keep you always uh, vigilant of your Iman and your Deen, and where you're heading with your Islam. This is the thing. Does it mean that the generation is going to come is going to be worse? Well, some of the ulama, they gave interpretation to this hadith, is that that means before the Day of Judgment, there will be no Muslims at all. How is that? Because the Prophet said that before the Day of Judgment is established, Allah Azza wa will send that, that breeze and that wind that will take the souls of all the believers. And then when the Day of Judgment is established, it's established on the worst generation on earth. There is no, no one at that moment will be saying Allah, Allah, or Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. That's what it means, Allah. So always be hopeful that Alhamdulillah there, is, there will always be khayr. There will always be khayr in the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu He said sallallahu alayhi wa al-khayru fiya wa fi ummati ila yawm al-qiyamah that khayr and goodness will remain in my Ummah until the Day of Judgment. Wallah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.